how can these people be wrong over and over and over again and still watch their bank accounts grow, still have people who trust them, support them, and will defend them possibly unto death? Why do people still trust them so much? How many times have people believed that they've received prophetic messages and have acted on them and some of them spending their entire lives acting on them? These hopelessly useless prophets are still a minority and they are a laughing stock. If it weren't so, they wouldn't be getting disavowed by their own assumed allies, and they are. There is a reliable litmus test of a true prophet, and that is that a true prophet is always right. It's a very broad, very thin definition, and the practice of it is always based more on repetition than it ever was or will be on inspiration. Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective and a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And it's time to get Unbound. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Matthew 7, 15, and 16a from what was my favorite translation back in the day, the New Revised Standard Version. These people's own book lays this out for them, and yet Kat Kerr can still get 4,000 views in a day. And Greg Locke is still out there asserting his rightness, and people are still listening. Mm. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And in this episode, we're talking about modern prophets, many of whom are so complex completely around the bend that even other evangelicals, evangelical leaders, no less, can't deal with their levels of batshit or bullshit. We'll be looking at the two biggest current hot button issues in prophecy and seeing how they match up to what most of us learn about the nature of prophecy from the average evangelical pastor. But first, <laughs> Mike Lindell's rantings and Jim Baker's blankets, dressing in ways that won't make the boys spank it. <laughs> <laughs> Why tell two stories when you can tell three? Welcome to Christians Behaving Badly. Shell, what have you got for us this week? Oh, wow. That was great. I'll even say it backwards for you. Wow. Oh, that was good. Um, first up, Mike Lindell, the My Pillow Guy and Devoted Trump Stan, says that Donald Trump will be in office by fall. Really? Oh, of course he will. I guess August was just too soon to uh, get that together. That was his last prediction. Was yeah. Sometime in August. And it'll it'll happen again. Oh, sure fall. it will. I mean, I just think about Mission Impossible. Yeah. When springtime rolls around, we want to start paying you. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> Maybe when fall rolls around, yeah. we want to start paying you. It's this, this is very, very standard for these people. Yes. Yes, it is. He was speaking at the Health and Freedom Conference in... Tampa, Florida, which is also part of the Reopen America tour. The conference features such august speakers as General Michael Flynn, Judy Mikovits, Sherry Tenpenny, Mark Burns, Greg Locke, and many others. Greg Locke. Yeah, I know. Ugh. A true cavalcade of election, COVID-19, and QAnon conspiracy theorists. You know, sometimes I feel really sorry for Mike Lindell. I don't. I don't know. He's just sort of pitiful. He just seems so enthusiastic and he tries so hard, but he never quite hits the mark. So he tries so hard, got he gets so, so far, far, but, but in, in the, the end, end it, it doesn't, doesn't even, even matter. matter. This yeah. is true. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking that when I wrote that phrase, too. I was I'm like, sure you were. Great minds think alike. <laughs> he has worked relentlessly and fruitlessly to prove that the 2020 election was a fraud. He's released multiple, quote unquote, documentaries. Big air quotes. Big air quotes there to try and prove this. His determination to prove these things would be kind of inspiring if it weren't so sad and disconnected from reality. But it's entertaining. I mean, you got to give it that. It is entertaining. I don't think anywhere near as many people take him seriously as he thinks do at this no, point. No, I, I, I really don't. And honestly, what he says in this who could take him seriously? True. True that. I mean. Oh, my God. This this quote coming up. People, brace yourselves for the I quote. I know, right? I'm just, I'm just saying. Brace yourselves. 
He told the crowds over the weekend that he would be holding a cyber symposium where the cyber guys will totally prove that the election was a fraud. Really, he totally promises. Here's a small sample of his speech. We're bringing in all the cyber guys. All the cyber guys. They're going to be there. Then we're bringing all the media. Maybe even Fox would show up. What a concept. And then we're going to bring in all senators, governors, even the corrupt ones. Even the corrupt ones. What a guy. (laughs) Secretary of States and every single government official who wants to be there. Because when we show him these packet captures, we're going to just give them out to all them cyber guys so they can have their own guy go. How many votes were flipped here in Tampa? Here you go. Boom. I can't. You know, I'm trying... And yes, I'm actually listening, okay? But I'm trying to put a picture together in my head of this scene that he's describing. Yeah. And fuck if I can even begin to put this together. I think he thinks that the packet captures are objects Mm -hmm. and not just lines of code. Oh my God. Yeah, no, that's pretty much what it sounds like. All I can think of is add a hash brown and send it to the internet. Any Cobra Kai fans out there, fantastic show. It's going to be a worldwide event. Millions are going to see it. Those Supreme Court justices are going to look at it then, and they're going to go 9-0 that this country was attacked. The election is going to come down. Donald Trump will be in office by fall, for sure. For sure this time. For sure. Two bad movies that he's been sued over. Yeah. And... More of this, okay, well, you know what? It may not have happened yet, but it's gonna. It's gonna. It's yeah, gonna. It's gonna. Where does it end? I don't know. But, you know, Trump being in office by this fall might be difficult since the Supreme Court will be in recess from late June until sometime in October. Yeah, first but, week of October. But it's gonna happen. Well, October totally. is still fall. Yes, it is. It's still fall until December 21st. True. So... When we get into our main segment, that's the kind of logic that a lot of them use when they say shit like this. And I just, I don't understand how anyone can take him seriously. I don't know if anyone does. Well, I'm certain that there are people who take him seriously. Well, they did invite him to speak. Yeah. Well, you see, there's that. There's that one little bit of evidence there. But just think about who this guy is, what he represents. And now ask yourself, back in the day... Did you know anyone else who thought like this? We knew plenty of people who thought like this. Uh So I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there still taking him seriously. But again, just a little bit of a snippet into the main segment. There are also plenty of people out there that understand that he's a laughingstock. Yeah. And it's the same thing with all of these quote unquote profits that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. What else have you got for us? Well, once again, my favorite grifter, Jim Baker, is at it again. It seems he needs money to keep his ministry afloat. So if you send him $500, he'll send you a mug and a blankie. I like mugs and blankies. Yeah. You can, of course, buy the mug for a mere $15 at the ministry's online store. But that blanket, that's not available anywhere else. So So it's a collector's item. I guess. I'm sure you can find a comparable blanket without the PTL logo at Big Lots for probably about $30. How much does he want for these? He wants a total of $500, but I see him like also talking about $1,000 donations. It's crazy. Um, But here's Baker's plea. I'm asking everyone who would say, Jim, I'm going to stand with you. We're going to beat the devil back. We're going to beat him back into hell where he belongs. I mean, the massiveness of what God is doing through this ministry is so unbelievable that I just know that if everyone gives, we're going to make it through this. It's going to grow and grow and grow. If you can give $1,000, do it. If you can give the $100 offering, you can do that. If anyone is still with the special PTL blanket, you can ask for it. Um, Was he kind of like sleep deprived or something when he Uh, said this? Because, I mean, there's a difference between insane and incoherent. If anyone is still with the special PTL blanket, you can ask for it. Still with what? Still still with me on this crazy ass ride that I'm taking people on? Uh, Still with the blankets. Oh, I'm I'm down with the blankets, especially in wintertime. Yeah, I guess. I prefer that they don't say PTL. Yes. 
yes. The prophet's mug. That's a well, that's a personally. Fun one I too. just think he's scared. He's running out of money. Oh yeah. Of course, the reason his ministry is hurting for money is because he peddled fake VD and coronavirus cures and was shut down by the courts. And then Visa and MasterCard cut him off, making it very hard for him to take in money. In April, he stated that he may have to declare bankruptcy. Aww. He's like a Poor Batman Jim villain. Baker. He's kind of like a, a Batman villain, like a really sad Batman villain. He never gets that crime doesn't pay. <laughs> it's true. But here's the thing. It does to the extent that yeah. there are still idiots out there sending him money. Yes. And just because he's hit a rough patch, guess what? He's hit them before. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, then that's the thing about these people. I don't know how they manage it, but most of them, they get forced back under their rocks. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, they crawl back out with something new and fresh. And all of a sudden, here come the donations again. Yeah. So, you know, these things just keep coming around in waves. Yeah. How many years was it? I mean, granted, he was in jail for some of it. But yeah. how many years did you hear nothing about this guy? Oh, now, yeah. all of a sudden, we have new fodder every fucking week for this show just based off of him. Yeah. I was surprised that he had a ministry. I was like, did people forget? No, it's not a matter of they forget. Wait until we get into our main segment. There yeah. are reasons why people keep bouncing back after they have fucked up so many times in front of so many people. There are definite reasons for it mm. that we're going to get into. So maybe we could just call this entire episode a huge Christian behaving badly segment because the things that you are bringing up in these stories tie in well to what I'm going to be talking about later. But, you know, there's an exception to every rule. And I think that we have come to the single most cringeworthy point of this thing of ours tonight. This is our bonus round. Um, let's let's just get this over with. <laughs> oh, it's so creepy. It's incredibly creepy. Really? You know, you can always count on three things. Death, taxes, and Christian men trying to control everything women do. Christian men are really, really concerned with how women dress. No, they always have been. They always have been. They used to call it clothesline preaching. I remember sitting in a church service where the guy was giving a clothesline sermon. And I'm like, I've never heard this before. Is this the I one don't. that I talked about? A few yeah. weeks ago, the same yeah. one where the dude yeah. was assessing his wife before church and told her to put a pin on her blouse because, quote unquote, she was showing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I was just sort of like sitting there fuming. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. And we had to be on our best behavior because I was, for all intents and purposes, I was the associate pastor yeah. of the church that we were going to at the time. And we were visiting this church this particular Sunday because the churches were about to merge. Yeah. So not only were you sitting there fuming, but we both had to be on our best behavior. Yeah. And just sort of go to our happy place because yeah. I was sitting there just listening to this guy and thinking, what the fuck must it be like to live with you? Scary. I'm sure. I'm well, sure. But not for her, because no. for her, we're talking complete and total normalcy. Yeah. We're yeah, talking that, absolute normalcy, that's, which is very scary. That's And it's also very sad. The news item is that a much-praised Christian musician named Matthew West has released a new song called Modest is Hottest. Modest is Hottest. Oh, just shoot me now. Thank you to... Don't wait till you get home. No. <laughs> Thank you to Friendly Atheist for publishing the lyrics because I do not want to watch this video. No, neither do I. I did see the thumbnail. I highly recommend seeing just the thumbnail to the video because not only does the guy have the most punchable face ever, but his younger daughter is looking at him like, what the fuck, dad? And that's literally true. It's true. It's literally just like true. she's looking at him like he is the craziest nut job she's ever heard. Oh, yeah. She is not looking like she wanted to be at that photo shoot like oh, no. at all. Well, I mean, can you imagine being his daughters? That's embarrassing. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, my God. As everyone except Matthew West probably guessed, this song has earned a lot of backlash on TikTok and other social media. Good. Bring it. Here's a quote from one of the articles. It's all in the show notes. Mm -hmm. 
Some people understand that the song is supposed to be a lighthearted take on an age-old struggle, as Matthew himself wrote on Twitter, and have been laughing about the song. However, others have questioned whether the song is actually a joke, arguing that women should not be demonized for wearing revealing clothes, dancing on TikTok, and talking to boys. Now what in the misogyny is this, one person commented? Another said, the instant nausea that went through my body. Can confirm. Yes. I didn't even... Um, just, I've read the lyrics. Yeah. And that was enough. Yeah. Can confirm. There are so many things wrong with this, a third person added. Can also confirm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to really understand the backlash, here is a small random sampling of the lyrics. Oh, Jesus. Brace yourselves, people. Yeah. Dear daughter, it's me, your father. I think it's time we had a talk. The boys are coming round because you're beautiful, and it's all your mother's fault. Oh, Jesus Christ. If I catch you doing dances on the TikTok, in a crop top, so help me God, you'll be grounded until the world stops. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Because modest is hottest. The latest fashion trend is a little more Amish, a little less Kardashian. What the boys really love is a turtleneck and a sensible pair of slacks. Honey, modest is hottest. Sincerely, your dad. And on behalf of men everywhere, bullshit. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. And I'm also I'm not thinking, talking about young girls putting it out there. It's just, no, this is not in any way, shape, or form what any right. what any heterosexual, sexually aware male <laughs> thinks on this subject at all. Yeah. I'm just putting that out there. Right. And also, it's like, dude, your kids are children. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be sexualizing children no matter what they're wearing. That's true. I mean, but seriously. I it, it feels to me like he's looking into the future. I don't want to get into analyzing these fucking lyrics, but it feels to me like he is looking more into the future. Right. Because, well, I mean, what do you actually have to worry about with the boys when they're children either? You know what I right. mean? They're kids, but like the older one is probably about 13 or 14. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's about the time when you have to start actually having some real conversations about these yeah. things. I, earlier, these days. I yeah. mean, let's, let's face it. When, yeah. when we were growing up, 12, 13 was about right. You kind of have to get on the ball earlier these days, yeah. too. So what I'm hearing is that your girls need to be wearing more clothes because the boys are coming around. And what? What are you afraid of? If you're doing a halfway decent job of parenting, your girls know how to handle themselves. And despite what your pastor might tell you, it makes no difference what a woman or girl is wearing when they get assaulted. Nope. Matthew West deserves every bit of criticism he's getting right now. As one Twitter user said, if my husband sang something like this to our children, it would be the last day he was my husband. Oh, no doubt. I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking about just the, there are so many things. There are so many toxic concepts in evangelicalism in just that little bit you've got the toxic masculinity thing you've got the purity culture bullshit you've got this men are superior to women thing going on and women have to alter their routines their dress their way of doing everything so as not to excite the boys bullshit yeah you know we all have this capacity to not necessarily turn on and turn off these base tendencies that we right. have, but we as adults should have enough control over them to not let them interfere with our lives. And when do you start to learn this? You learn it when you're an adult and you're in church and surrounded by all these women in turtlenecks and sensible pairs of slacks. No, you have to start learning this when you are younger, as a younger boy, I think that it's important that you learn that everybody has their own sense of morals. Everyone right. has their own definition of what modesty is. And if something seems just a little bit too, quote unquote, immodest for you because it does things to you, well, I'm sorry, but that's on you. Right. Learn how to deal with those issues so that when you're an adult, you have a snowball's chance in hell at being able to have a normal relationship with a woman, especially if you are going to get married. Yeah. You know, um, that's a whole other discussion as to, you know, yeah. whether or not that's still a good idea in modern society. But um, if that's something that you want, 
then you better figure out how to approach women from the standpoint of not patriarchy, but partnership. Right. And not from the standpoint of sexualization, but from the standpoint of individuality. Not every girl is going to want to wear turtlenecks and slacks. And the ones that want to wear halter tops and miniskirts should be allowed to without being slut shamed for it. Right. There's by no, anyone. Yeah. There's no reason to do that. It's just patriarchal thinking. Yep. And that's some of the most toxic thinking out there. Yeah. And and sometimes it gives birth to shit babies like this. You know, yeah. that's and it sucks. But that's just the way that it is. And as long as this kind of thought is allowed to keep perpetuating and resonating out into the pews every single week, this is the exact thing that it's going to produce. Yeah. And that's that. And with that, I just want to remind everybody that our Patreon is live at patreon.com slash Unbound Podcast Network. If you have a few bucks you can throw our way, starting at the $5 level, that's just over a buck an episode. You get early access to all the content that we put out, and you'll be helping build this into something bigger and better over time, too. So if you have the means to toss us a fiber, fantastic. Patreon.com slash Unbound Podcast Network is where you want to go. And if you are just flat busted broke, can't help us at this point, that's perfectly fine, too. Like I say every week, keep getting what you need from this. But please tell someone new about the show. Give it a chance to grow and spread and let the people that you know need to hear it get in front of it and get in front of it just a little bit easier. And that becomes easier when we rise in ranks on sites like YouTube or when we get noticed on some of the podcast platforms. And that involves things like five star ratings and reviews to be able to start bringing us up the charts just a little bit there. And if you can do some of that stuff for us, it doesn't cost you a penny, costs you a little bit of your time. But if you think that what we're doing here is worthwhile, then I believe that that is every bit as valuable as your money. So please support us in any way that you can, whether it's with your dollars or whether it's with your likes, shares, five star ratings and reviews. We can use all the help we can get. And we appreciate that you're here and that you're coming back every week. And we're proud to be able to do what we're doing here and to keep this resource in front of you and for you to be able to get what you need from it week after week. Just keep coming back and support us in any way that you can. And just one more thing before we get into our main segment. Uh, tonight's episode is episode 68. So that means that our next episode is going to be what? Episode 69, 69 dude. dudes. And... Uh, I'm not going to get into specifics about what this episode is going to be about. Suffice it to say that we are going to be diving in head first on the topic. <laughs> and I think that it's one that uh, everyone's going to enjoy a little bit more lighthearted. We've done some pretty heavy stuff here lately, mm -hmm. but I think that we need something a little bit more positive, maybe a little bit more on the embarrassing side, but in a good way. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. So every show only gets one episode 69. So I really don't want to waste this one. And I got some really, really interesting stuff in the works. So just make sure you come back next week because we've got a really, really special episode of Unbound coming <laughs> next week. With that, <laughs> with that, onward into our main segment. So this time around, we are talking about self-proclaimed prophets who just keep dropping the ball and yet continue finding an audience for their stupidity in alarmingly large circles within evangelicalism. For starters, it's important to level the playing field from the beginning. Just like any other so-called spiritual phenomenon, prophecy isn't a real thing. It never has been. It never will be. That said, I can absolutely see how people in the Bronze Age could be duped into believing it. When you're dealing with a bunch of people who are largely illiterate, it's easy to pull the literary bull over their eyes. To any sane, reasonable person, the reason why so many Old Testament prophecies came true in the New is very simple. When they wrote the New Testament, they wrote the fulfillments of the Old Testament prophecies into it. It seems so elementary, but when you're dealing with people who take the Bible literally, thinking that everything chronicled in it is actually, factually, literally true and happened. It's not that simple. 
Now, this is another one of those situations where I feel like I was fortunate to be in the particular evangelical circles that I was in because, you know, for good or for bad, I had people around me that were a little bit more sensible than average. They had better brains than average. And I got some really, really good education about this back in the day. And it came up multiple times during my teenage years. And I can remember talking with my youth pastor around the time that we were discussing me and the uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that I had been seeking this and I wasn't getting it. And he asked me, what what's my motivation here? What is it that I feel like I would be best suited for with this? And I remember saying right off the bat, healing and prophecy were going to be the things that I was going to be praying for the most and being able to provide not just tongues, but interpretations and that sort of thing. And my youth pastor told me, just be very careful how deep you dive into that and know that you know that you know that what you're getting comes from God, because there is a reliable litmus test of a true prophet. And that is that a true prophet is always right. I was taught to be skeptical of false prophets, oddly enough, and it's odd considering where I was and how many people were just allowed to spew off in tongues and give interpretations just in a normal church service on a Sunday. So I got some mixed messaging there, but I think our senior pastor tolerated a little bit more than he actually wanted to at times. So... What happened sometimes in church services, if it wasn't too outlandish, if it wasn't too over the top, then he would kind of let things go and go with the flow a little bit more. I did see him halt a couple of things in their tracks a few times when it came to tongues and interpretation. And that kind of solidified in my head the whole notion of what false prophets are and our responsibility to call them out. And that's a concept that's going to be visited a little bit later. But as for what I was taught, the biggest takeaway that I have from that time in my life and, and the questions that I had that surrounded this was very simple. Be careful who you listen to and hold anyone who calls themselves a prophet accountable. And that's going to be revisited in a couple of minutes, too. See, I was taught these things and I heard them from multiple sources. That means that in as much as everything they say is by definition cuckoo, even evangelical pastors have limits to the degrees of cuckoo that they'll actually endorse or embrace. A case in point is evangelical radio host Michael Brown. In a New York Times article called Christian Prophets on the Rise, What Happens When They're Wrong, he said, quote, in my lifetime, 49 years as a follower of Jesus, I've never seen this level of interest in prophecy, and it's unfortunate because it's an embarrassment to the movement. And that's someone with an actual voice. That's someone that people listen to and trust. And it encourages me to know that there are people out there that think like that, and he is far from the only one. This guy, I think, would get along well with pastors and spiritual leaders that taught me, which further solidifies in my head that there are plenty of people out there, clergy in particular, who may be taken in by the concept of prophecy, but still not afford it carte blanche in the accountability department or more to the point in the lack of accountability that exists within this so-called movement, especially right now. And while I'm sure that there are also plenty of astoundingly stupid, brain-addled, and just slightly daft pastors endorsing the myriad of false prophets out there. That isn't how most modern quote-unquote prophets amass their followings. Most circumvent the pulpit and go directly after their target demographics through other means. Most of them are the TV or internet preachers buying airtime or cultivating social media audiences and using the same emotionalism and sensationalism that is signature to all evangelical messaging to capture the attention of the pew sitter and start the all-important process of building relationships and gaining trust. This is what they do. It's good marketing. Now, you're probably thinking, but if they're wrong, doesn't that kill the trust aspect of things? It should, shouldn't it? But here's the thing. It doesn't. Why? Because they know the psychology of their audience and they play right into their hands. And here's how they do it. Here's how they pull off being wrong and still being thought of as prophets. 
For starters, they admit that they were wrong. Then they act disappointed and apologize. They come up with their reasons for why things went sideways in terms of what they prophesied. And then they proceed to capitalize on their own fallibility. I'm only human. We make mistakes. I forgot to carry the one, the rapture's in 89, not 88, that sort of thing. (laughs) And then they scapegoat their God. They encourage trusting God to act and give them clarity because if they were wrong, it's because God was too vague (laughs) or something. They even encourage people to pray for them to get the proverbial double portion of God's anointing so that they can see things clearly and prophesy more accurately. So it's not that I'm not a prophet. It's that there's too much static on the line and I need you to pray for a better connection between me and God. It's that level of chicanery and people buy into it. But why? Why does it work? How can these people be wrong over and over and over again and still watch their bank accounts grow, still have people who trust them, support them, and will defend them possibly unto death? Why do people still trust them so much? Well, all of these points shine a spotlight on the prophet's humanity. And it's a huge and inescapable point of relatability that every single person listening on shares with the prophet. When they're wrong, they plead, I'm only human. I'll do better next time. And people just accept it. Let's not forget that although so few of them practice it as a general rule, Christians are conditioned to champion forgiveness and they're more willing to forgive one of their own if that person is or seems to be in possession of something they want or if they're telling them what they want to hear. Our comments going forward will center primarily on the two current cash cows in false prophecy. That's the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, again, I'm going to be saying his name a lot. And it kind of bugs me. I thought about the notion of just bleeping it out every single time. Mm -hmm. But I think that it will drive people nuts. And myself included, having to listen to it and edit it and all of that. So I'm going to bite the bullet. And we're going to say his name again. Donald fucking Trump. I will refrain from using that adopted middle name every single time I say it. Just know that it's in my brain when I say it. It's always there. It's always there. So different themes do emerge at different times, like the end times and rapture, return of Christ. These, those two are actually pretty huge, but not right now. Right now, it's all about pandemics and politics. But like we pointed out a couple of weeks back, everything old is new again. Politics and social issues have never been immune from the prophecy treatment, and that means all the way back to biblical times. Prophets have always preyed upon one concept more than any other, and that concept, I think, is a little thing called hope. Hope, as Morgan Freeman once adeptly narrated, is a dangerous thing. People cling to it. They hope for the return of Christ, and that hope makes them gravitate toward prophets who promise that it will happen in their lifetime. They want Donald Trump to be president again, so they flock to prophets who claim over and over and over again that somehow Donald Trump will be back in office and Joe Biden will be ousted. They don't have to qualify it. They just have to promise it. And when it doesn't happen, they just make another promise, rinse, repeat, They're wrong again, they make the same excuses, and the cycle just repeats over and over and over. In a vast majority of cases, that is how it's going to pan out. There are, however, those who have a more visceral response when their prophet gets it wrong. Such was the case with Jeremiah Johnson, a self-proclaimed prophet who has made predictions about everything from COVID to Supreme Court appointees and more, but... What got him in real trouble was when he tried his hand at prophesying about Donald Trump's re-election. In fall of 2020, he, quote, shared a prophetic dream of Mr. Trump stumbling while running the Boston Marathon. Oh, there's a lovely picture for your head right there. Mm -hmm. Until two frail older women emerged from the crowd to help him over the finish line. Um, Mary and Martha, anyone? So when Joseph R. Biden was certified as the winner of the election, Mr. Johnson had to admit that he had let his followers down. I was wrong. I'm deeply sorry. And I ask for your forgiveness. He wrote in a detailed letter he posted online. I would like to repent 
for inaccurately prophesying that Donald Trump would win a second term as the president of the United States. Well, guess what? He suffered immediate backlash. He received multiple death threats via social media and literally thousands and thousands of emails that he described as, quote, saying the nastiest and most vulgar things I've ever heard toward my family and ministry. He lost significant amounts of funding from his donors and was accused of being, quote, a coward, a sellout, and traitor to the Holy Spirit. Oof. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say is, oof. That's harsh. Yeah. That is harsh. But when you consider what the litmus test for a prophet is supposed to be and the responsibility that I was taught I had as someone who was pursuing the gift of prophecy, it does make sense on a certain level when you apply varying degrees of righteous anger to it. And the anger toward this guy is on both sides of that particular scale. Maybe it's fear of this kind of backlash that drives others like Johnson to push back against similar criticisms. An article on Politico.com reports that, quote, instead of apologizing or backtracking, a number of prophets continue to assert that it is God's will for Trump to be in the White House and that a miraculous reversal is nigh. And by number of prophets, they mean all the pastors and other spiritual leaders who parrot the same basic sentiments, not all or even most of whom are actual prophets by definition. But let's not forget that prophecy is one of the gifts of the Spirit that is chronicled in 1 Corinthians 12, and amateur prophets are out there delivering interpretations to messages in tongues every week in Pentecostal churches around the world. So it's a very broad, very thin definition. And the practice of it is always based more on repetition than it ever was or will be on inspiration. Even the high profile ones do little more than parrot each other while adding their own twisted branding to the message. The levels of vitriol on behalf of the faithful that we see surrounding failed prophecies about Donald Trump are in fact unique. I don't think I have to go into another long dissertation about the average demeanor and capacity for reason that the average red hat wearer possesses or the levels of aggression that they are capable of displaying. When I look for information about backlash concerning rapture prophecies, I find words like disappointed and perplexed. When it comes to Trump prophecies, I find examples like the one above. The past year in particular has been a circus of failed prophecies between prophecies about COVID and this ineffable notion that the 2020 election is somehow still not a done deal. Chuck Pierce, quote unquote, prophesied about a plague back in 2019 and conveniently and was able to see the impact on America of COVID-19. He said that we would see plague-like conditions in the world by February. This prophecy was made in January of 2020, arguably after the media had already made it clear that a global pandemic was underway. He then assured the masses that the virus would recede over the course of the next few months, beginning with Passover. Okay, I got a link to this article that you can read the whole sordid thing, but I mean, just the way that he frames this and the audacity of it with absolutely no way of knowing whether or not he was going to be right and probably knowing that he wouldn't be right, but that he'd still get those donations to come in first. I think honestly that that's where most of it came from and why he was less afraid to say what he said about this. But, you know, of course, no such thing happened. Just to give you the Reader's Digest on this, he describes what was supposed to be a Christian Passover where we would survive the night with COVID-19. And then after that, it would just taper off and it would be done after another couple of months. Well, I don't think that I need to even comment on the fact that it didn't happen. No such thing happened. And the world experienced a second wave in much the same way and on a similar timeline as the Spanish flu pandemic that started in 1918. Chuck Pierce wasn't delivering prophecy, just paying attention to history at least as it applies to the rise and spread of COVID. From that point, he needed a hook. So he took his cues from other evangelical sources and COVID deniers, often the same people, and hopped on the, this will all be over soon bandwagon. And to be fair, federal and state governments weren't exactly quick to admit to the severity of the pandemic either. We started out with a two week stay at home order. 
then that extended to three weeks, then a month, then six weeks, then two more weeks, and so on and so on. In the meantime, here I am a year later, still wearing a mask in the car that I give driving lessons in. Given the information that the public was getting, his predictions seemed safe. If the lockdown was only going to be a few weeks, predicting a 40-day ramp down on the heels of Passover was plausible. It was a reasonable gamble at the time, and it was nothing more than that. But the plausibility of it did motivate other so-called prophets to follow on Pierce's coattails and either parrot his predictions or make their own, thereby demonstrating the validity of the prediction. Strength in numbers. It just goes back to that. Either a lot of people will be right and they'll all enjoy a rabid fan base with wide open wallets, or they'd be in good company if they were wrong and would be able to direct attention to the fact that they weren't the only ones who missed the mark. Oh, and they can also scapegoat their God on it too. Too much interference. We didn't know what God was trying to say here. That's why we were all wrong and we were all basically saying the same thing. So in as much as we heard from God, yeah, we did. And there's the proof. We were all wrong and pretty much wrong in the same way. It, it's crazy, but that's the logic that they use. Wow. American prophet Cindy Jacobs called for and led a global day of prayer to, quote, contain COVID-19, and that was back in March of 2020. That worked out well, didn't it? But here's the problem. The word faith crowd gained a tremendous foothold out of it, capitalizing on the concept of total eradication of COVID in a short expanse of time. They seized upon the opportunity to spread their signature brand of stupid that involves things like simply denying the power of a deadly virus and confessing that it has no power over you. This led directly to the widespread denial of the power of the virus that became more secularized to include allegations that it was never a threat to begin with, just a well-organized hoax with a half million plus casualties by the time a vaccine became widely available. Denial in the case of both COVID and the Trump election outcome has been a dangerous outgrowth of this growing culture of prophecy without accountability. The completely unpredictable outcomes of both were easy targets for would-be prophets for all the reasons I just described. But the arguably nonsensical loyalty of those who keep their sights set on false prophets is the result of psychological bondage that can be and is often used to keep people in a specific and very toxic headspace. When COVID doesn't go away, deny its actual threat level and tell people it'll be over once the Christians experience their own personal Passover. When Biden is sworn in as president, it's a lie of the devil and God's will is yet to be done. If a prophet makes a mistake, that doesn't mean that this isn't God's will, just that the details are still a little fuzzy. Aside from the subject of his failed prediction, what did Jeremiah Johnson do wrong that so many people turned on him really? I think the answer is simple. He ostensibly stopped at stage two of the con. He admitted he was wrong and apologized. He didn't continue the thought through the next logical stages, jabbing at the emotions, points of relatability, and the faith of the individual. In short, he wasn't as good a social engineer as most so-called prophets, or he chose for undisclosed reasons to deviate from the playbook and try to let the sleeping dog lie. In the case of the continuation of the Trump presidency, that just wasn't something that was going to happen. The ones that maintain their followings are the ones who are sticking to their guns and holding out the stick without the carrot to their hapless faithful. And this is not a difficult task. After all, we are talking about people who are walking examples of the subjects fawning over the emperor's new clothes. Actual reality doesn't mean anything near as much as the one they want. Alternative facts, anyone? Mm -hmm. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the current performers in the evangelical prophecy circus. As I started thinking about these people and their delivery styles, I got this image in my head of a sort of prophetic version of the WWE. All of them extreme caricatures of their own facades, just like pro wrestlers are extreme caricatures of athletes who are really just actors. You have that and you have prophets who are really just cartoonish idiots. With that, let's look at our first idiot, our, our prophet, Johnny Enlow. Self-described Christian prophet Johnny Enlow has said that his, quote, vision of Republican former President Donald Trump holding a golden scepter with a golden crown on his head proves that Trump is still president of the United States. So he had a fever dream, so this must be reality. 
He said the vision was Trump's present status from heaven's perspective. This is coming from an article from Newsweek, by the way. And all I could think as I was reading that is, oh, Jesus Christ, let the stupid begin. I don't know what bothers me more here. The fact that this person had the audacity to engage in this level of unbelievable bullshit or the fact that I can now see this in my head and it won't go away. Mm -hmm. This god awful image of Trump that this guy painted, I can actually see it. And I really wish I couldn't. On April 29th of this year, a statement signed by 85 religious leaders called on all modern, quote, prophets who made public predictions about Trump returning to office by a certain date to apologize if that date is come and gone. It was described as a necessary, quote, mature act of love to protect the honor of the Lord, the integrity of the prophetic ministry, and the faith of those to whom the word was given. And... I mean, if I put on my evangelical thinking hat, that makes perfect sense. And these actually are the types of people that I used to hang out with. These were the types of people that I learned from, the ones that thought like this. So it's actually encouraging to me to know that there are more and that there are plenty more out there, that I wasn't just in a very lucky and fortunate niche that tempered a little bit of reason with the ridiculous. You know, there was that. And here is what Enlo had to say about that. He said, quote, those who refuse to disagree with God must now be pressured in. Uh, uh, this is so whiny. Yeah. It's so whiny and self-serving. Those who refuse to disagree with God must now be pressured into accepting the steal under the guise of being humble enough to admit being wrong. How about being humble enough to keep agreeing with God even after believers and fellow leaders push for abandoning what he has clearly revealed? Oh my God, just the sheer level of delusion in that one little statement is absolutely staggering. Not only is it delusional thinking, but, and now that I'm saying this, is it delusional thinking or is it just another way to keep them from getting burned at the stake, at least figuratively? There is that aspect of it too, because... Guys like this, and there are more of them, and I've got at least one more example, but there are people that play the victim card the way this guy does and lay it on even thicker than he does here. That quote actually was from a Facebook post from April 30th of this year, but there's more to it. In the same post, Enlo repeatedly references Joe Biden, calling him, quote, the thief, and implicates, quote, the media as being co-conspirators. Enlo toes the standard evangelical conspiratorial line that Biden stole the election via unprecedented voter fraud. That, of course, proves only that he's one of Trump's lapdogs, just echoing the campaign's assertions of fraud over and over and over to the point where people who are almost as crazy as him are calling for a cease and desist. Just think about that. People who are as batshit crazy as him want him to shut the fuck up. <laughs> then there's Greg Locke. Described by Politico as a Nashville pastor with a massive social media following, took a very definitive stance on the Trump presidency by stating under no uncertain terms that Trump would, quote, 100 percent remain president of the United States for another term. This from a YouTube video he uploaded on November 13th of last year, 2020. In a May 18th article in Newsweek, Christina Zhao said, quote, controversial pastor Greg Locke sent in a fiery speech to congregants that former President Donald Trump did win the 2020 election, as he had predicted, but isn't in the White House because it was stolen from him. I mean, just over and over and over again, same mantra, same shit, different article. In a video he shared on Twitter, Locke basically made one of the most arrogant and stereotypically charlatan moves there is. He actually tried to assert that he was right using some of the most convoluted logic ever. I have to warn you, when I first read this, I felt like I lost IQ points. So hit that 15 second button at least twice if you don't want that to happen to you. Still there? Okay, you are aware of the risks. He said, I did predict and I did say that Donald Trump was going to win the presidency of the United States. I made the statement that Donald Trump was going to win. Right, 100%. I kept saying, yes, he is going to remain in the White House. Everybody said, oh my goodness, he didn't do it. He's a false prophet. He then added, now, let me tell you something. If I predict that your team is going to win and you do, but the opposing coach breaks into your house in the middle of the night and steals your trophy, that ain't on me. That don't 
make me false. That makes them liars and crooks. Amen. That's what it makes them. I, I had a huge wait, what moment with that one. Not going to lie. There's a lot there. I mean, just the insult to my intelligence that that would have been to me as an evangelical is practically beyond measure. Today, forget about it. It was one of those close the lid, walk away before you throw the laptop kinds of moments reading that. And you were there, you know. Yeah. You totally know. Yeah, it was bad. Just, well, oh, don't make it sound that bad. Yeah. I, 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 was, I, was, I was largely irritated. Yeah. And Very I was due for a break from the research anyway. Yes. So I, that was, it was just a good place to just close the lid yes. and take a few deep breaths. Walk away. And, you know, just, just try, to, try to not be steeped in the stupid for five minutes. You know what I mean? Just ponder with me the sheer audacity of what he's saying here. What he's saying is, I was right. He won. Just because someone stole the election doesn't make me wrong. Personally, I would love to have access to a cam or a drone. You know, make it a drone. Let's make it a drone to follow Greg Locke around just so I can see for myself if he's actually that hopelessly narcissistic in real life or if he's just playing a role, you know, like a pro wrestler. <laughs> I'd be interested to know if this is true of the rest of his flaky friends, too, for that matter. But enough about Greg Locke. And I'm, honestly, there's part of me that wishes I had a little bit more to say about him because what's coming next is not this. This is not one of my favorite people. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go directly on record. Um, this next one, I I don't know what it is about her. Maybe it's the raw, unadulterated crazy that she emits. Maybe it's the unwaveringly vacant, fixed expression. Maybe it's that I can't say for certain that this woman doesn't have two glass eyes because they're always glazed over and they don't seem to move or maybe it's the way the stupid just shoots out of my brain and bounces off the walls of my skull clanging like big fucking ben inside my head each and every time i hear her speak whatever it is i just find this person off let's just call her off and i'm talking about a certifiably crazy quote-unquote prophet by the name of cat kerr We've talked about her and her stupidity recently. She's the one who claimed that Trump won, quote, by a landslide and that God told her that Trump would serve as president for eight years. And that was just for starters. She's also the one that claims to have a picture of angels and demons fighting that she can't find. She also makes claims that there's an ecclesiastical meat locker in heaven stocked with body parts for those who pray hard enough to get them. Her latest video has 12,000 views in just three days. Not that much by YouTube standards, but still pretty alarming considering that this is her latest video and her messaging just keeps getting crazier by the day. I would have to give her views to be able to summarize some of the plethora of prophetic messages she posts to YouTube. So if it's all the same to our listeners, I'm just going to say go to YouTube, plug in her name, and prepare for some absolutely epic face palming as you read just the descriptions of these videos. Don't give her views. Yeah, by all means, do not give her views. Just, just read the descriptions because they're priceless. Now, this is not a prophecy that I'm about to describe, but it goes a long way toward illustrating just what we are dealing with here with Kat Kerr. If I were to be honest, this woman is not unique. She is not the first one of her kind that I have either met or heard about. I've seen this level of crazy before just at church level, and I've seen it multiple times. So what's the difference between Kat Kerr and one of the numerous crazy people that I've had corner me at church and start spewing all kinds of crazy like this? What's the difference between them and her? Simple. She managed to find an audience. I'm not sure how. I'm not sure why. All I know is that sometimes chance favors the insane. And this is one of those times. Again from Newsweek, evangelical prophet Kat Kerr says she won't get vaccinated, but would have if Trump won the election. This isn't the position of a rational thinking adult. It's the kind of self-destructive toddler level reaction to something that my grandmother used to call cutting your nose off to spite your face. And I'm sure mine was not the only grandmother who used that phrase. And here are her own words. Quote, I may have trusted the vaccine when Trump was sitting where the villain fraudulent person is sitting, she said, referring to current Democratic President Joe Biden. And I love having those words roll off my tongue. 
You have no idea. Well, you do. If you listen to this show, you do. But because they're not, I won't trust it. I don't trust you. I don't know what's in it. I don't know the makeup of it. Okay. All right. Well, here's your response, Kat. Here's, here's my response to you on that. Let's try to remember that the vaccines were largely developed during the Trump administration and that this was one of his Hail Mary attempts to sway voters. A vaccine by the end of the year was what he promised and kept taking credit for it in an effort to pour just that much more fuel on the fire during his election fraud crusade. But this crazy bitch won't take the vaccine because Trump wasn't allowed to hand deliver it to her. Pointless and childish. And those really are the most redeeming descriptors I can come up with for this. And the ones that I mentioned just now are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more like them out there, and they're wreaking all kinds of havoc in big and small ways over these two issues in particular, but over a whole lot more that passes for quote unquote prophecy. How many times did I have people walk up to me and tell me that they had prophetic messages for me? And how many times have people believed that they've received prophetic messages and have acted on them? And some of them spending their entire lives acting on them. While there are loads of people out there laughing at people like this, as well they should, as well they should, because they're worthy of ridicule. They're not worthy of respect. As many as there are out there laughing at these people, there are also many who are sitting in the pews of their churches every single week, soaking the stuff in, believing it, basing their lives and their behaviors and a lot of things on it, making really, really bad decisions about things like not keeping up their homes. We've talked about this in the past. People who are convinced that Jesus is coming back within a certain time frame and just letting all of their earthly everything go to pot because what difference does it make? We're not going to be here much longer. And then there are people that are prayed over and someone speaks in tongues over them and someone else interprets it. And the interpretation is you need to give up your aspiration to do what, whatever you're going to do with your life and go to Bible college and people believe it and they do it. This is dangerous on so many levels. On the national level, we see a lot of mockery right now. But what about the people who are sitting there and watching these people on TV and watching them on YouTube or hearing all of this crap buzzing around in their churches on Sundays? What about those people? And what about what it's doing to their lives? Tonight, we looked at a tiny but very visible sample of the people behind this so-called prophetic movement in the United States in particular right now. It's, it's international, but a lot of it is focused here. There are plenty more of these so-called prophets out there, many leading megachurches and who have specific niche followings who also parrot the same messaging. And for as many who have backed down at the behest of slightly more intelligent colleagues and cohorts over things like the Trump election or anything related to COVID-19, there are those who will never back down, stop resetting timelines or making predictions. These people are woefully unoriginal, and they prey on the types of people who just keep tuning in, falling for the same cons over and over and over again, and tapping those and tapping those donate buttons over and over again as well. The popularity of modern prophets and the ever lowering of the bar on the definition of a prophet is one of the more destructive outgrowths of a religious system that trains its adherents to operate within a framework of unquestioning faith and belief about literally everything. And when the smoke clears from all the COVID and Trump idiocy, I fully expect new vendettas to arise. And when they do, people like Shell and me will be here to expose all the parallels and provide just one more voice of sanity crying out in the wilderness against the foolish, infantile chicanery that has started, to the chagrin of many of their own, to define evangelicalism. The smarter ones among their ranks see failed prophets as a threat, as they should. If I take solace in anything about all this, it's that there are still some among the evangelical ranks with enough brains to draw a line in the sand and stay on the opposite side of a prophetic movement that is hopelessly corrupt even by the fairy tale standards of religion. As far as I'm concerned, let both sides have the mic. Let the lunatic prophets make 
a complete mockery of their movement and let the world laugh at them and let the ones who see through the facade keep bringing as much balance to the force as they can. The former group, though, is destined to always have the louder voice, I think. Steve Taylor said it best. A Christian can't get equal time unless he's a loony or committing a crime. People just don't like too much reason with their religion. They never have, and they never will. And this prophecy circus really is like pro wrestling. It's escapist entertainment that appeals to a specific demographic. It elicits emotional responses, just like sports, and it is able to capture and hold people's attention virtually indefinitely. These people aren't wrong. They just haven't correctly interpreted God's message yet. Trump will be back in office on January 20th. It'll happen. Um, maybe in April. Maybe June. Maybe this fall, according to Mike Lindell. And I just can't help but realize that if she needed to, Scheherazade could have kept the story going indefinitely, too. And so can these people. And while they'll always have detractors, guess what? They'll also always have followers. This is why Shell and I are here and why we, along with a growing list of atheist content creators, thought leaders, and influencers, will always be here to provide the point-counterpoint when their stupid is showing. Be encouraged by the fact that no matter how loud their voices may seem, these hopelessly useless prophets are still a minority and they are a laughing stock. If it weren't so, they wouldn't be getting disavowed by their own assumed allies, and they are. They're an embarrassment to their own movement, and secular voices from atheist podcasts to national news outlets are making sure the world sees them for what they are. And if we keep using our voices, if we keep the truth at the forefront of our comments and conversations, reason will prevail, even if it's only to the extent that this sort of juvenile posturing becomes irreparably stigmatized from within the evangelical ranks. No, I don't think we can take down an entire religion by exposing and laughing at false prophets. But if we stay visible and stay vocal, it might motivate others to follow us. And that could lead to more people getting and staying unbound. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.org. Org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.